بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله الصادق الوعد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين لله تعالى have good intentions make sure you're in this session for the sake of Allah تعالى only no that the Muslims, at the time of the Prophet wasallam, and after his death, were all upon one way. There was no obvious difference among them, nothing apparent. And whoever was amongst those companions, among those who differed with them and were hypocrites, that is, whoever was physically mingling among them and showing themselves to be Muslims but truly they weren't Muslims and they were actually hypocrites who were pretending to be Muslims they were unable to openly show what they had hidden in their selves that is, they weren't able to openly fight Islam and they weren't able to debate with the companions openly. The first difference that appeared among the Muslims was their differing about the death of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. To the extent that some said he did not die. However, he was raised up like Jesus, the son of Mary, was raised up. And this difference among them was removed, was eradicated by the blessings of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. When he ascended the member, the pulpit, and he delivered a speech and he recited to them. The saying of Allah, إِنَّكَ مَيِّتٌ وَإِنَّهُمْ مَيِّتُونَ If you translate the ayah literally, it would say, O oh Muhammad, you are dead and they are dead. And of course, the Prophet ﷺ was alive at the time he received this verse of the Qur'an. And it means you shall die, and they shall die. Then Abu Bakr, he said, as famously reported about him, Man kana ya'budu Muhammadan fa inna Muhammadan qad mat. Whoever used to worship Muhammad, Muhammad has died. Wa man kana ya'budu rabba Muhammadin fa innahu hayyul la yamut. And whoever worships the Lord of Muhammad, he is the one who is alive and does not die. And we learned that in reference to this hadith, the Wahhabis add a baseless addition. They say that Abu Bakr said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ الَّذِي فِي السَّمَاءِ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتِ they say, then Allah, the one who's in the sky, is alive and he does not die. And this addition has no origin, no basis. What's confirmed from him is that he said, فَإِنَّهُ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتِ He is alive and he does not die, in reference to Allah. When Abu Bakr delivered this speech, then... The selves calmed down, the hearts gained some peace for the truth being clarified, and the people submitted to the fact. And all of the people confessed and submitted to what was obvious and the difference disappeared amongst them amongst them they didn't differ about that anymore 
The second difference is they're differing about where he should be buried, alayhi salatu wassalam. Some people said he should be buried in Mecca. They said Mecca is his birthplace. It's the place of his Qibla, the Kaaba. It is the place of the rituals of the Hajj. It is the place upon where the revelation first descended upon him. And it is the place where his grandfather Ismail is buried. Alayhi salatu wassalam. Others, they said, he should be transported to Jerusalem. They said, certainly, there is the stomping grounds of the prophets. And the site of their battles. May the salawat of Ar-Rahman be upon them. And the people of Medina said he should be buried in al Madina because it's the place of his immigration and its people are his supporters, the Ansar. And this difference also was eradicated by the blessing of As-Siddiq when he narrated that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Anbiya'u yudfanoon haythu yuqbadoon The prophets are buried where they die. The prophets are buried where they are taken. It means they are buried where they die. So they accepted his narration and they resorted to his saying, and they buried him in his chamber. That is, they actually moved the bed over that he died in and dug the grave right there. And they buried him there. The third is they're differing about who should be in charge, who should be the imam. The Ansar, the people of al Madina, said there can be an imam from amongst us and, and an imam from amongst you, the immigrants. And the discussion went on for a long time until Abu Bakr as-Siddiq ascended the pulpit, the mimbar, May Allah accept his deeds. And he delivered a speech. Then he recited to them the saying of Allah. Lil fuqara il muhajirin alladhina ukhriju min diyarihim wa amwalihim yabtaguna fadlam min Allahi wa ridwana. يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ That's the eighth ayah of Surah Al-Hashr. It means Allah praises those poor immigrants who are driven out of their homes and driven away from their properties And they migrated seeking the generosity of Allah and seeking the acceptance of Allah and supporting the religion of Allah and supporting the messenger of Allah. Those people, they are the truthful ones, the honest ones. Ula'ika humu sadiqun. Abu Bakr said in this ayah, Allah called us, he means the immigrants from Mecca. He said in this ayah, Allah called us as the truthful ones or the honest ones. Now, someone hearing this part of the story might say, he might find something in himself. He might say, so you're telling me Abu Bakr got up on the mimbar and recited an ayah from the Qur'an 
and basically used this ayah from the Quran to validate himself and to validate his peers who came with him from Mecca to Medina. And everybody accepted that, meaning especially the people who weren't from Mecca, they accepted that. Somebody might find something like that scratching at his chest, like, ah, uh, it's a little bit hard for me. You know why it's hard for someone to accept that? Because he's not on the level of those people, all right? These people, even though they were differing, those weren't people like ourselves who are differing and fighting with each other in their egos. They weren't people who were, you know, who each of them had egos and agendas and their... Um, hoping to be in charge and things like that. They don't want these guys to be in charge, but they want these guys to be in charge. And uh, they're seeking power for themselves and they're, you know, ready to uh, go against others who want power, et cetera, et cetera. Now, who are these people to think that they are the truthful ones? No, no, they weren't. They were way beyond something like that. This ego trip. Those companions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they wanted to establish the religion of Allah and they wanted to follow the rules of the religion. They wanted to push the da'wah. They didn't want to be in charge and to have power. And I'm not making that up. Anyone who knows about the stories of these companions, he knows that this is their case. When some of them did get in power, they had patches in their clothing, and it's not because they couldn't get any other clothing. They absolutely could have. When some of them get, did, some of them were insisted to take charge and to be put in charge of things, and they didn't even want it. They were assigned to act in a certain way, to, to take certain positions. And then, because their real desire was worship, they used to worship so much that it was thought of them that they probably are maybe being negligent in their duties of ruling. Think about that. Not that it's not, you know, drugs women, alcohol, or whatever that's preventing them from doing their jobs. It's not um, embezzling money that's preventing them from doing their jobs. It's because they don't want to stop praying. Because they really weren't even interested in being in charge in the first place. So this, this is not a discussion between people who are like, no, you're, we don't want you in charge. I want to be in charge. We should be in charge, not you. Abu Bakr, he recited the ayah for them. And among those people of, of Medina were scholars and very pious people. So it's not like Abu Bakr is just reciting an ayah that they don't know and they don't understand. So he recited this ayah to them. And in the ayah, Allah says about the immigrants, <laughs> They are the truthful ones. Abu Bakr said, in his speech, he said to the people, In this ayah, Allah called us, the immigrants, truthful, honest. Abu Bakr continued, saying, And furthermore, in another ayah from the Qur'an, Allah commanded the believers to be with those who are truthful. To stand with, to be with, to be in compliance with those who are truthful. And then he narrated for them that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al A'immatu min Quraysh. The Imams should be from the tribe of Quraysh. Yeah, it is possible for the Caliph or the Muslim ruler to be from other than the tribe of Quraysh, but now we're not going to discuss the rules of um, caliphate and the rules of leadership, etc. So they believed him in his narration, and they 
submitted to the judgment that he presented to them. And they all agreed to what he said. And so this difference also vanished because of the blessings of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Then after him, after Abu Bakr, there did eventually appear the dissension of the of some of the Khawarij people where they said that the caliph doesn't have to be from Quraysh. They differed with this judgment later. The Khawarij didn't exist at the time of Abu Bakr. It didn't exist at the time of Omar even. So later on, this some people came back and rehashed the issue. Difference in the religion will not be dangerous unless it is in the fundamentals of the religion. That is, in the matters of creed, in the, in the convictions, the Muslim convictions. And in reference to the companions, this did not occur. There was no difference among the companions in the essentials of the belief. Now, if you want to talk about the companions having a difference among them in belief or not. If you want to give a good, precise statement, say, there was no difference among them in the essentials or fundamentals of the belief. And don't say there was no difference among them in the belief at all in any way whatsoever. Yani, don't say there's no difference among them in belief like that. Now, if it were said, like if some of our teachers said that, for example, then it would be a general statement. But they did differ about some things like some of the companions said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not see Allah on the night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. And some of them said he saw Allah with his heart, not with his eyes, on that night. He saw Allah with his heart, not with his eyes. So some of them said he saw Allah with his heart. That means literally Allah created in his heart the power of sight. We mean that literally. He literally saw Allah, but not with his eyes, with his heart. That's what some of the companions said. And some said he did not see his Lord on that night. So what appears from that is what? That they differed. Now, it's possible. It's possible that those who said that he did not see his Lord on that night meant he didn't see Allah with his eyes. That's possible. But then we'll be explaining it in a way that's different from what appears. So what appears is that they actually differed about that. But did they differ that Allah can be seen, which is the essential belief of Muslims, that, that God can be seen, and that he will be seen in the afterlife by the believers? They didn't. So the actual fundamental belief, the companions didn't disagree about that. The detail... With his eyes, uh, I mean, with his heart or not, they differed about that. And it's even possible that they didn't really differ, but the words make it look like they did. Why is it important that you say a precise statement? Because if you don't, let's say you're talking to a Shi'i. A Shiite, and you say the companions had no difference amongst themselves in the belief. Just like that, he's going to stop you and he's going to say, huh, so then what do you say about this issue? And then he'll bring up the issue about whether the Prophet saw Allah with his heart or not. Alayhi salatu was salam. And that actually happened to me once. Um, 
I want to say without boasting, but only as a fact, it was the only time that I can recall that I didn't have an answer. And it was because what he said was true. I, I, Yanni, I set myself up for it. I said, and there was Shiites there, the companions didn't differ about the belief, and he got me with something that I already knew to be true. And there was nothing I could say, but, well, and I, Yanni, he got me, Mashallah. <laughs> because if, after that, what are you going to do? Backtrack and say, well, what I meant was, then he's going to say, well, you should say what you mean. He's not going to let you go. I wouldn't. Right? If I was debating with somebody and he said something like that, I'm not going to let him slide. He didn't let me slide. So that's a lesson. Now, just for the record, uh, because I just said that it's the only time that I can remember that, you know, somebody silenced me. Um, I once had a long debate. Maybe this was in 2013 about the issue of Qibla. With a whole chat room or like it was, what do you call me against the world? If a whole chat room or group full of Muslims who face the wrong way. And um, they claim to be Malikis. It was a long, 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 long debate. Went on for days, mashallah, and through text, through, you know, chat. And... There are people who say, I saw you get crushed in that debate. You were crushed in that debate. They smashed you. They destroyed you. I witnessed it. But they did not, mashallah. I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm trying to, you know, protect my own rep or something like that. I'm not. But because I'm saying this in social media, then somebody might say, no, no, that's not true. There was another time, too. There was that time when I saw you get annihilated because i heard that several times i have the discussion i have that debate um i saved it the, the entire debate from beginning to end and i was actually thinking of putting it out on youtube but i just didn't want to keep beating people over the head about the kibla issue i have a lot of kibla videos on youtube and uh seems like people aren't so interested in it these days so i only only for that, I didn't want to, you know, put it out and be beating people over the head about this issue. Let's move on. But I have the entire discussion. So, no, that's not true. Anyway, the difference in opinion will only be dangerous when that occurs in the fundamentals of the religion. Amongst the companions, there was not a difference among them in that issue. Rather, the difference that existed among them, the scholars among the companions, was a difference in the branches of the religion, not the fundamentals of the religion. Like cases of inheritance, for example. And so, there was no difference in opinion among the companions that necessitated deeming the other group one group deeming the other group as major sinners or for one group to disown themselves from the other group like that the issue was upon what is correct the muslims were on the right belief not differing in the matters of their belief their scholars differing in detailed branches of the rules not in the belief and not even in the fundamental rules but the details of those rules which is very normal actually even among non-muslim society for example like look at judges don't they differ they say you know in this case some rule like this and in the, and some rule another way and they have discussions about it and debates about it. They write articles about it, etc. So the matter was going according to what is correct and proper in the days of Abu Bakr and in the days of Omar and at the beginning of the time of Uthman. 
Then they differed, the people differed about Uthman, the third caliph, and some people rebelled against him. And so what happened happened. It is known that Uthman was murdered in his home while he was reciting the Quran. His house was put under siege. People surrounded his house. He couldn't get out. Some of the companions appointed their um, strong, able-bodied sons to stand guard at Uthman's house, but some people managed to still sneak in. They put their sons at the, at the door of Uthman with swords. Told him nobody gets in. Nobody. So that was a big problem. Then after that, there was the difference about the matter of Imam Ali concerning the matter of the people of Al-Jamal, the people in Basra, the Muslims who stood against Imam Ali, and the people of Safin, the people who are with Muawiyah who stood against Imam Ali, and the case of Ali and Muawiyah appointing moderators. Some people took that issue out of proportion. They blew it out of proportion and started deeming people as kuffar for appointing mediators. That was the khawarij. Their fitna, their tribulation appeared in those days. They were the ones who deemed that appointment of mediators as blasphemy and they charged Ali, they they deemed Ali as a kafir and Muawiyah as a kafir. So there was a lot of fitna going on then, fighting and things like that. And also during the time of Imam Ali, there occurred the dissension of the Sabaiyah, who are the origin of the Shiite faction. What we learned is that the Sabaiyah are not truly Shiites, but they are the source of the Shiite faction. It might appear in some books that the Sabaiyah are Shiites, or the first of the Shiites. And what we learned is that they're not really Shiites, but the Shiites came out of that. And what is that? The Sabaiyah, they followed a man named Abdullah ibn Saba, who was a Jew who claimed to have embraced Islam. And then he came out with a cult of people who worshipped Imam Ali. So they worshipped Ali, and they are the ones who said, Ali is. God of the creation. He is the God of creation. Until Imam Ali, he burned some of them. He burned a group of them. He burned them alive. After that, the rest of the groups of Shiites started springing up. Over time, not all at the same time, of course. Now, you might be saying he burned them alive. What? This was Imam Ali's ijtihad. That he saw that he could burn them alive. Ibn Abbas said, had I been the caliph, I would have done differently. I wouldn't have done that. But that's what he did. MashaAllah can. Um, and by doing that, he definitely scared them and they stopped. Like no one would, after that, no one who was left among them would openly say that he was a worshiper of Ali or that Ali was God or something like that. And... In the days of the last of the companions, before the era of the companions had completely gone, so the last of them, those were the ones who were 
young when the Messenger of Allah passed away, alayhi salatu wasalam. They might have been teenagers or children when the Messenger of Allah passed away, alayhi salatu wasalam, like Ibn Abbas. If I'm not mistaken, he was 13 when the Prophet passed, alayhi salatu wasalam. So by the time those were old men, so the last of the companions, that's when the deniers of Qadr appeared. Those people used to indulge in talking about destiny in the forbidden way and talking about the human being's ability and what they mean was that he can create his own deeds like Ma'bad al-Juhani and Ghaylan al-Dimashqi and Ja'ad ibn Dirham. And whoever was still alive among the companions, when it reached them that there were people who talked about destiny in the forbidden way, they denounced them. Like Abdullah ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Abi Awfa and Jabir and Anas and Abu Huraira and Uqbah ibn Amir al-Juhani and their peers. And they had advised their successors, those who will come after them, to not give salam to such people, those deniers of destiny, nor to visit them when they are sick. وَلَا يُصَلُّوا عَلَيْهِمْ إِذَا مَاتُوا Nor to pray for them if they die. Then, after that, they're at, يعني, in the time of Al-Hasan al-Basri, so this is the time of the followers of the companions now, there occurred in the city of Al-Basra the dissension of the man named Wasil ibn Atta al-Ghazal. He's the first Mu'tazili. In the matter of Al-Qadr, and in their saying that there's a station between the two stations. And they mean there's a status between being a believer and being a non-believer. They said the one who commits a major sin is neither a believer nor a non-believer. They said the major sin will kick you out of belief and not insert you into disbelief. That's a strange belief of theirs. And a man named Amr ibn Rubaid agreed with Wasil ibn Atta. He agreed with him in what heresies and innovations he invented. So Al-Hasan al-Basri, he kicked them out of his circle, kicked them out of his session. And they shunned those, they shunned that man and his followers so that they sat at another part of the masjid. They were outcasts. فَسُمُّوا مُعْتَزِلَةً لِعْتِزَالِهِمْ مَجَالِسَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ So they were called Mu'tazila, the outcasts, because they were outcasted from the sessions of the Muslims. And they were outcasted because of their saying that there's a station between the two stations. And they're claiming that the major sinner is neither a believer nor a disbeliever. And that the major sinners exited faith but did not reach the level of blasphemy. And that they said that they will be in hell if they die without repentance forever and ever with the kuffar. And they added on top of that that it's not permissible for Allah to forgive them. And that's blasphemy. And that had they been forgiven, then that would be a lack of wisdom. So when they showed up with these sayings, the Muslims shunned them and abandoned them and forsook them like what their predecessors among the companions had advised them to do. Then in the days of the Caliph, Al-Ma'moon, 
the Najariya appeared. The dissension of the Najariya. They were a group who agreed with Ahlu Sunnah in some issues and agreed with the Mu'tazila in some issues. And a group of them settled in the town of Roy and the surrounding areas. Then also in the days of Al Ma'mun, there appeared the Baltiniya. Those are the people of the hidden inward meanings, secret meanings. Those are the people who would interpret the ayahs of the Quran in any way they so please. In our times, we have seen people who are Baltiniya. Baltin means inside or hidden. The Baltiniya are the people who claim to believe in the hidden meanings of the verses of the Quran. They say there's apparent meanings, outward meanings, for the normal people who are the donkeys. But there are, for the special people, hidden meanings that don't appear to the donkeys. And then they go and interpret the verses of the Quran in any way they so please. So they would say, for example, that the rivers of paradise mean wisdom. And that salah means following the imam. And that anything they want. There's no rule after that. Once the person claims that there's such hidden meanings, there becomes no rule um, for explaining the Quran. In our times, we've seen this in such groups as the so-called Nation of Islam and um, the so-called five percenters who are a an offshoot of the nation. Five percenters are a branch off of the nation, so-called nation of Islam. And other groups also who do such things. For example, one of those people would say to a Muslim, do you know who Muhammad is? That Muslim would say, yes, Muhammad is... The Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, the Arabian prophet. They would say, la, that's not Muhammad. Then that Muslim would say, what? A'udhu billah, what are you talking about? They would say, you are Muhammad, and I am Muhammad. Because Muhammad is just a name with a secret. Don't you see that the meme... The first letter of Muhammad is the head. And the ha, the second letter of Muhammad, is the body. And the meem, the third letter of Muhammad, is the navel. And the dal, the last letter in Muhammad, is the feet. And then they would say to him, do you know who's Ali? He say, yes, Ali. Everybody knows Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib. He would say, la, that's not Ali. The Muslims would say, then who's Ali? They would say, you are Ali. And I am Ali. And we are all Ali. Because Ali is just a name with a secret. Don't you see that the Ain, the first letter in Ali, is the I? And the Lam, the second letter in Ali, is the spine? And the Ya, the third letter in the name Ali, is the feet? Stuff like that. And you know what the five percenters used to say, arm, leg, leg, arm, head, and all that stuff. Same stuff. Yeah, I need the same way. It's the same way. They're not all saying the same thing, though. This group, al Baltiniya, they are not counted among the 73 groups that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in his hadith. When he said that the Muslims will divide into 73 factions, this Baltiniya group are not a part of those 73. Also, the Sabaiya that we mentioned just shortly, um, a moment ago, they are not from those 73 groups. Those Baltiniya were really Majus people. They were on the religion of the Majus. They used to pretend to be Muslims. They could not show their religion outwardly in the society that they were living in. They were people who were descendant from um, the Persian fire worshippers. So they had an inclination to their ancestral religion. For a lot of people, that's not something hard to understand. Like black Americans, there's a lot of 
We know a lot of black people are inclined towards some Africanism or African religions or even paganism because it's African, they say. You know, African paganism because they want to go back to their roots. So they were like that. They were people who were descended from uh, Persian fire worshippers. They had inclination to their ancestral religion. They weren't able to just practice their religion openly in the society that they lived in. So they basically agreed amongst themselves. They made code words. They used Islamic words, Muslim words for things in their religion. So they were like a secret group. And they had a specific goal of misguiding Muslims also. Not just they wanted to practice their religion covertly. They intended and they did. They intended to misguide people and take them away from Islam. Then there appeared a little bit later now around 250, the year 250 after the Hijrah close to the end of the Salaf, there appeared the um, dissension of the Karamiya faction. Those were an early carnation of Wahhabis in their belief that Allah is above the throne. So they're not Wahhabis. They don't believe all the things Wahhabis believe. Wahhabis have a, a bunch of wrong beliefs besides their believing that Allah is above the throne the Wahhabis they say that every innovation is bad they said that Tawassal is bad they said that Tasawwuf is bad and they pretty much say everything is bad and they walk around with those frowns on their faces uh, anyway <clears throat> MashaAllah and Allah knows best we'll stop there if you have any question I can answer for you, I'll be glad to. Somebody has a question, I think. Yes, salamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, what what book were you doing? Ah. I was reading from At Tabsiru fi Deen by uh, Abu al Muzaffar al Asfarayini. It's the summary of Al Farqu bain al Farq. <laughs>